Good morning, everybody. Welcome to session nine of the OBWB Source Water Protection Webinar Series, Monitoring and Reporting for Source Water Protection. I respectfully acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from Kelowna, BC, the traditional and unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan people. I encourage you to please take a moment to think about and acknowledge the traditional territories you are joining from. And as I've said in previous weeks, water provides excellent opportunities for reconciliation. And as local governments and water suppliers, which many of you in the audience are, we have a unique opportunity because we're on the ground and we can play an important role of building positive relationships and partnerships with Indigenous communities centered around water protection goals. Source protection planning processes are strengthened when Indigenous values, knowledge, and leadership are included from the start. So today we'll have a quick introduction from me, and then we're joined by two pan panelists, one from a local consulting company, who you'll recognize, and another from a non-governmental organization, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. Reminder that webinars are recorded and posted on the Source Water Protection Toolkit website. You can get PD training credits for attending the webinars. And I encourage you to submit your questions anytime throughout the webinar using the Q&A. So not the chat, but the Q&A function. And we will hopefully, if um, we follow our time well, we'll have time at the end for a formal Q&A period. So a big thank you to the so, so many people that were involved in this toolkit project and creating these webinars. So as I mentioned before, we have a really great technical advisory committee that met at least six times over the last couple of years, people from local governments throughout the Okanagan, health agencies, provincial regulators, et cetera, um, who helped develop the content for the toolkit. And then Heather Lorette and her team uh, were the co-authors. And then we've had Casey Moran. Thank you very much, Casey, for all of the help putting together this webinar series. Here's the toolkit, and so it's available as a PDF document, or you can go to sourcewaterprotectiontoolkit.ca and browse the toolkit as a web format. So part one is the roadmap to source water protection, and it clarifies the source protection planning process for the water suppliers. It boils it down into five steps. Part two are the tools, and this webinar series have been focused on these tools. So we've got eight tools in the toolkit. For each tool, it talks about what it is, how to apply it, and then many case studies to uh, illustrate how it's being used. And then part three is this just hefty addendum of additional information and resources that dive deeper into some of the topics that are presented in part one and part two. Here's what the layout looks like. So again, part one, those five steps to a source, creating a source protection plan and carrying it out long term. And that just shows how it links to the tools. So the tools are the actions that you would include in your response plan. And then on the far right, there are the different sessions of the webinars that are focused on each of these tools. So if you're interested in a specific tool, you can go and watch the recording of the webinar that's um, listed there. Quick recap of our webinar series, as this is the final webinar. So it's just been awesome. I can't believe it's been nine weeks already. We had 32 speakers throughout the webinar series, two today and 30 before now. So we started off uh, way back October 20th and we had a webinar that focused on part one of that toolkit. So the, and the introduction section and, and part three, the additional resource or the additional information section. So we had presentations by Rob Bertels who was kind of like the, the first person who really pushed for this toolkit to happen from Interior Health. Heather Lorette, who uh, helped write it, and myself at the beginning there. The second webinar, we had a ton of people. <laughs> we actually ended up having probably too many because we went over, but it was really interesting because we had members of two different technical advisory committees talk about how they're working together between jurisdictions, sectors, departments, and their geographic areas to bring cumulative source protection benefits to their region. So it was a really interesting conversation. We had um, from the North Okanagan, the Dudo Creek Advisory Committee, and from Vancouver Island, the Regional District of Nanaimo. Webinar three, we focused on Indigenous-led projects and partnerships. So we heard about the Couch and Watershed Board from Dr. Shannon Waters and the, the good work they're doing in the Couch and Watershed on Vancouver Island. And then the, we heard of the Kemchiniqua Floodplain Reengagement Project in Penticton area. Um, a, 
a collaboration between the Nalkin Center, Penticton Indian Band, and the Okanagan Nation Alliance. Webinar four, we hosted people from Ontario. So we had Government of Ontario, Conservation Ontario, and a few regional conservation authorities tell us about how they're developing consistent communication and outreach materials and using them across the entire province of BC. Webinar five, we had two speakers. So we had a legal expert, Deborah Curran, and she talked about how water suppliers, local governments have a lot of policy and planning and bylaw tools at their disposal that can be used to protect source water. And then Rod McLean gave us a very tangible example of what they're doing in the city of Kelowna in their integrated watershed planning um, approach that they're, they're embarking on in Kelowna. Webinar six, we had Brianne from City of Victoria talk about their stormwater utility and how it's bringing them um, funding to support source protection. And Neil Fletcher talked about how local governments can collaborate with non-governmental or conservation groups to access funding that might not necessarily be available just to a local government. Webinar seven, we had three folks talk about how they're using um, natural asset planning and green infrastructure to protect water sources in um, Toronto, in the West Kootenays, and in the Comox Valley. And then last week, we had Matthew Bourbonnet, Brian Kylstra, and Jamie Self give us a really practical uh, presentations about how they're using mapping or how you can use map or mapping or geospatial data to understand risks and to manage those risks. So that's what we've had over the last eight weeks. Today, we're focusing on tool eight, which is monitoring and reporting. And so in the toolkit, these are the topics that are covered. So we talk about the requirements for good data. And then we have a table that is basically a guide to designing and carrying out a monitoring plan. And so these are kind of the things that um, our speakers will be focusing on today. So today, we're lucky to have Heather Lorette here again um, from Lorette Aquatic Consulting and Paige Thurston, the Database and Community Engagement Coordinator with Living Lakes Canada. So Heather has more than 40 years of experience with water quality, environmental reclamation, mine reclamation, wetland development, bacterial remediation of mine wastewater, reservoir management and project design. And she was the project lead for the Source Water Protection Toolkit as I've mentioned earlier. Paige is the Database and Community Engagement Coordinator with the Columbia Basin Water Hub. She applies her background in environmental monitoring, data analysis and community education to support database contributors and those accessing the data to inform research, decision-making and water stewardship initiatives. I'm really looking forward to the presentations today. So I will invite Heather to share her screen and start us off. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, looking forward to presenting here today. Is that working now? Looks good. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Heather. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to all of you and thank you for uh, sharing this time with us. Um, seems like a really dry subject, uh, how to be a science communicator to decision makers, but I'm hoping to make it come alive over the next uh, 20 minutes. We may view ourselves as generalists, I know I certainly do, but that pales in comparison to decision makers. Folks like city councils have to know about streetlights, policing, homelessness, uh, roads and uh, land development, policies, taxation. The breadth of the knowledge they need is quite terrifying, really. So how do we offer our message amidst the zillions that they receive? And why do we want to, to be science communicators? And I want to focus the next couple of minutes on why it is so difficult to be an effective science communicator. What are the roadblocks? So I'm going to start you with a question. What do you get if you cross a scientist with a politician? Obviously, it's a little bit south of the border uh, to us. But as with many cartoons, this one has meaning on several levels, and we scientists have to acknowledge the political lens. I've often joked that communicating with watershed protection to decision makers is uh, a, a disaster or two is always very helpful. And unfortunately, 2021 was completely unprecedented. 
and it illustrates perfectly the need for source water protection. We had fire and flood throughout the year. So starting off with the heat dome, we had unprecedented heat, uh, breakage of heat records by more than five degrees Celsius in 20 of them. Wildfires, entire communities, small communities, but entire communities were wiped out. This is a first for BC. We had droughts, which were not off uh, the charts based on other years. And if we start off with the third worst forest fire year for British Columbia, it was 2021. Second is 2017 and number one was 2018. It's a little disconcerting that these are all in the last five years. And it was the worst ever for Kamloops. And then we had the atmospheric river. But don't panic, everybody. 2021 is almost over. So I think there's not too much else we can have thrown at us. What a year and what a time to be living. Obviously, just doing things as we are is just not going to cut it for source water protection moving forward. So we now inhabit a world where environmental data is abundant. Never used to be. And models are producing better and better outputs. That's great. But there's low interest in that data. So why is that? Well, first of all, there's challenges bringing researchers and data managers together and providing consistent messages that speak to the values of the societies that we're trying to reach. And one of the things that is problematic again and again is the concept of uncertainty, which is essential to science. It turns out that we all have ambiguity aversion. Well, is it like this or is it not like this? But don't tell me it's somewhere in between those two. Unfortunately, science relies on the uncertainty concept and it's not okay to drop it when we're explaining results. Statistics, we used to call it statistics, but statistics let us calculate the uncertainty that occurs in measurements. So every time we take a group of data and we come up with an average, we now have uncertainty attached to that. Statistics lets us evaluate results. So it's essential that we always provide a statement that explains to your audience how they should interpret the reported measurement uncertainty. Don't just leave it to their intuition. Put in a statement that says, like the example there, reported uncertainties were calculated using blah, expressed as a 95% confidence limit which is a very common confidence limit to use. In this graph on the left, data shows a lot of scatter outside the green 95% confidence. Thus uncertainty is higher for this data set than it would be if all results go into the green zone. In other words, it's important to convey somehow the uncertainty that's inherent in your study. Measurements and calculations always need to express uncertainty. If you've created a mean, I want to see that plus or minus sign. It's very, actually very important to understanding the results that you're trying to convey to me. And it's important to understand how the data is distributed. It's very different. These three graphs may have, these three lines may have the same median, but they certainly are not the same kinds of, of distributions very narrow, the classic bell curve, and very flat. We need to explain somewhere how the data is distributed. I love this example over here. This is a statement taken from the Polis Watershed Security Fund report that was just recently released. 78% of British Columbians hold the view that BC needs to make major investments in watershed security to protect fresh water in this province. Agreed. And you notice that there's a footnote there. That's where they're guiding the reader to however they put this 78% together. Did they ask 1,000 people? Did they ask 10,000? How is the data assembled? We need to know that. It's a great takeaway message. And we have to acknowledge as science communicators that probably what will be remembered out of all of this research is most British Columbians hold this view. And I'm really grateful to learn that this is in fact the case. So how to communicate uncertainty. One of the first steps 
is to identify the data that's relevant to the recipient's decision. So in other words, it's not, our science communication is not really driven by what we want to say as scientists, it's driven by what the audiences need to know. So one presentation does not fit all needs. Definitely dial it into where the decision maker needs to, to come up with a decision. And characterize the relevant uncertainties, not everything, the relevant uncertainties, their magnitude. And it's our job, I believe, to develop a message that conveys the data's usefulness and its limits. Use st standard statistical methods and present them in a common format. That just makes it easier for the reader or the uh, recipient to grasp what you're trying to say. Also use mutually understood terms and invest the time to respectfully explain new concepts. It's okay to use science speak when we're talking to colleagues, but it's not okay when we're trying to communicate outside our circle. For scientists, uncertainty obscures the theoretical question. Was there a change in nitrate in this lake or was there not? But for people who rely on science, uncertainty obscures the choices. So do we need to make change on water, uh, wastewater treatment? So let's move on to how. I'm gonna offer five concepts and provide the concept and then an example of it. First, and probably if you take away nothing else from this presentation, please remember this. There is no substitute for long-term data sets. I'm sure you all know that already. It's absolutely invaluable to guiding decisions. So how do you go about that? You need to set up a monitoring program that your group and funders can fund every single year. Spending all your money in one or two years of data is not as good. And start as soon as possible. My goodness, especially in view of 2021. If you don't have historic data for the water body of your interest, Please try and find a reference water body in your region that has data from past years. And then you're gonna study the two in parallel for a couple of years so that you know how to make use of the older data. Also, I can't stress this enough, contribute to and use regional databases. That strengthens your analyses and strengthens the ones of the people that you work alongside. For example, we have a number of databases here in the Okanagan that have been going on for a number of years. And the first set, the Kalamaka data, data set, is 25 years strong, and it's a critical baseline for comparison. So when something strange happens, we know how to compare that. The Rose Valley data set was actually useful in identifying the cause of a serious and profound water quality change in a reservoir and to be able to link it back to change in watershed disturbance. Finally, the Ministry of Environment, we kind of expect them to have these long-term data sets and they do, thank goodness. And that has highlighted uh, trends in the data and it allows us to get the cause and effect teased out for those changes in spite of multiple influences. Some of these may be intuitive to you, but it's worthwhile going over them. Effective communication skills are probably not something we're born with. Every single talk we give needs to be tailored to that audience. What are their values? Why should they care? What decisions do they need to make based on our data? It's always wise to connect with curiosity, tie the presentation into their interest layers, explain and inspire. It's Important to simplify, but not by dumbing down. It needs to be respectful, truthful, and tell a good story. Remember, they are counting on us to convey our speciality while they're amidst a, a wash of all kinds of messages. It, it's important to relax and keep it real and relevant to the audience. And I think it's very important to, if you don't know the answer to a question, it's, very, it's okay to say, I don't know. I'll get back to you with an answer to that. It allows all of us to be real and acknowledge the limits of our knowledge rather than trying to pretend that we're experts on everything. Learn to listen 
have a conversation, not a lecture like I'm doing to you right now, unfortunately, but I'm looking forward to your feedback at the end of this. And understand the communication tool you're using and how it can contribute to understanding. So here's a graph and it's of chloride over the last four decades in Okanagan Lake. The light circles are the surface water, the deep, dark circles are the deep water. What is this trying to tell us? What's the takeaway message? Well, if it's a general audience, I'd suggest you might stop at the top. Human influence on Okanagan Lake is increasing. If we're speaking to an audience of uh, a municipal council, they might want to know the next portion. It's primarily through road salt delivered through stormwater. So stormwater treatment might be a valuable investment. If we're talking to a fisheries group or a habitat group, they might be more concerned with the fact that chloride in Okanagan Lake is not a direct water quality risk. It's just indicating that human influence is increasing. So here's how we tailor the message to the audience. It's another example. It's a beautiful little piece of work done by Rabin and et al. This is out of Australia. And, you, and the first plot shows you the municipal watersheds along with burn severity from their recent spate of terrible, uh, they call them bushfires. And the response through erosion. So the takeaway message for one audience might be increasing wildfire burn severity increases erosion unfortunately, especially near watercourses. Again, if we're talking to a municipal audience, they might also want to know that a lot of the municipal watersheds burned. So watershed behavior has changed. Forecasting of water quality and quantity will also need updating. And there are other erosion sources in addition to these burns. If we're talking to a habitat group that wants to be involved in remediating, they might prefer the lower message that there are areas of critical value to these watersheds that where remediation would be beneficial. Moving on to our third tool here, all of our beautiful work and reports creates a montage on the decision maker's desk, much like this graphic is suggesting, and it can be overwhelming. To reduce that, I strongly advise that we all use standard templates so that your data presentation is arriving at a regulator's desk in a form they can navigate quickly and they can use as a rapid reference. And provide summaries. This is the hard work we do to distill down what we're trying to convey into key messages at several levels of scientific confidence. It doesn't mean that other people are dumb. Like that's really, really important that we don't dumb it down. We're distilling it down. If they need to see it in broader detail, they can do that. I strongly advise that we use maps whenever they are intuitive and invaluable to providing that GIS context and the spatial analysis. And I also think that developing graphics is, is very much worth your time. So for templates, there are some in the source protection toolkit. You can use this uh, guidance right here to get to them. And we've used these for, to create over 20 uh, different source water assessments and response plans. And I strongly advise this is a good starting point. Your regulators will thank you, I think. Also use great graphics for communicating to your audience. Use the right visual, provide the context, Let's keep it simple. This is a graphic that we use. It's the anatomy, what we call of a seiche which is an internal wave in a lake that occurs when it's stratified, it seems to be something that a lot of people find confusing. So we developed this graphic to help explain what the heck are we talking about? It was worth the time to try and develop this graphic. Here's another example. What we're showing is there are areas where disturbance of, of sediments is at high at risk and very low risk versus where the intakes are. You can see that for the south end of Kalamaka Lake, they're at, uh, they get impacted by this quite frequently. We're asking boaters to transit through these areas and go play over here where it's not gonna cause a water quality problem. And then finally, and this is a capstone to this conversation, we're not asking them to give up the whole lake. Actually, the areas we're asking to stay out of are quite small compared to the entire lake. And there's some lakes that are less suited 
to say wake surfing that does a lot of sediment disturbance. Well, the final uh, step that I'm going to recommend here, this is actually, I think, really quite important. We need to avoid fear mongering. It sounds like a great motivator for, make, for change, but it's a very short term motivator. When we're presented with information that makes us fearful, and I would suggest that all of us are quite overwhelmed in the last couple of years, um, we'll find ways to jettison that message because it takes a lot of effort to maintain it and it's discouraging. So don't focus entirely on negative messaging or information, but also provide hope provide agency and steps forward, things people can do. One of the things that I thought was a really cool idea is making a low cost documentary film of your watershed and your water treatment plant, and then using it like Ontario did in webinar four. I think this is a great way to bring your audience along to understand what it is you know about the water situation and just help bring them up to speed to sort of where you live. And I also strongly suggest that we maintain wide channels for citizen feedback, really listen to grassroots groups and student ideas and stakeholders. Where are the common values where you can work together? Interestingly enough, in water treatment and designing new ideas, I've gotten some of my best ideas from grade three groups that I've spoken to. And offer citizen science opportunities like Nanaimo did these monitoring networks that they've set up means that they get great data at a lower cost. And the folks that are working to monitor speak to their groups of people. And so the information and the interest in source water protection grows from there. And offer feasible steps forward is our final step. And here's some examples from the toolkit. Is I think we think it's really important to build economic arguments for source water protection. Obviously, you're not doing that on your own. Collaborating with universities and other groups helps promote your concern. Also work with stakeholder groups to hammer out watershed specific solutions in your watershed, specifically in the high risk areas to you. You need to know those ahead of time and develop sustainable funding from the start. And your ideas and where you take it is super important to your success. Finally, simplify to clarify, it's all about locating shared values. Tell a good story, illustrate that story brilliantly and offer feasible steps forward. And here's a great example, I believe, of uh, encapsulating a lot of information into a simple message. Sustainability could be defined as live on the interest and not the principle, regardless of how massive the natural resource is. There's a lot behind that statement. It's very transferable, it's very true. It's not dumbed down. It's very profound. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Heather. That was an excellent presentation. I learned a lot. I always really enjoy listening to you speak. So go ahead and uh, stop sharing and then I'll invite Paige to share her screen. Hi there. Looks good, Paige. I'm just bringing it into full screen there. Everyone can see that okay? Excellent. Wonderful. Well, good morning and thank you to the Okanagan Basin Water Board for hosting this series. My name is Paige Thurston. I'm the Database and Community Engagement Coordinator with the Columbia Basin Water Hub at Living Lakes Canada. I'm joining you today from Nelson, BC on the unceded territory of the Tanaha, the Sinaixt and the Seals Nations. Uh, my presentation today will include an introduction to Living Lakes Canada, the purpose and development of the Columbia Basin Water Hub database, its operation, current impacts, learnings, and next steps moving forward. So about Living Lakes Canada, our mandate is to bridge the gap between citizen science and action to foster citizen-based community water stewardship. We are a nonprofit organization based primarily in the Columbia Basin, and we are also involved with a number of provincial, national, and international programs. A few of our flagship programs are listed here. You may recognize some of them, including the National Lake Blitz and the Upper Columbia Basin Groundwater Monitoring Program, which is featured as a case study in the Source Water Protection Toolkit, as well as the Columbia Basin Water Hub Database, which will be the focus of this presentation. Before I go into the details of the database, I would like to provide you with some background information on how it fits into the larger context of our work 
and the circumstances which motivated Living Lakes Canada to develop this resource. The climate change impacts are causing significant changes to water quality, quantity, and timing of flows in the Columbia Basin. The Columbia Basin is particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, given that our source water begins with the region's glaciers and snowpack, both of which are projected to continue to decline in coming years. The need for monitoring to understand our changing water supply is urgent, as we are already seeing climate impacts affecting hydrological cycles throughout Western North America and existing monitoring networks are insufficient to support understanding these changes. To further the concerns around climate change, a 2017 report prepared for the Columbia Basin Trust concluded that there were significant data gaps in the region and therefore insu insufficient knowledge of the basin's watersheds to make informed water management decisions. In response to this report, Living Lakes Canada hosted a conference later that year to facilitate an open dialogue around water data needs and potential solutions in the Upper Columbia Basin. At the conference, which was attended by over 100 North American water experts, there was consensus on the need for a coordinated monitoring framework in the region and for a centralized repository to store and access water data, both current and historic. This initiated the development of the Columbia Basin Water Hub database, as well as the Columbia Basin Water Monitoring Collaborative. The Columbia Basin Water Monitoring Collaborative is currently piloting an innovative way to develop a comprehensive monitoring network for the region. This begins with the creation of a priority monitoring matrix, which is based on both scientific needs and community consultation to identify priority watersheds for additional monitoring. So the priority monitoring matrix is currently being developed for three pilot areas in the West Kootenai, Columbia Valley, and Elk River Valley. Data gap analysis is being conducted and local reference groups are being assembled in these areas to help us understand the priorities and concerns of community members, First Nations, the private sector and local governments. This approach will achieve economies of scale and nest efforts to create a cost-effective regional monitoring network. Monitoring is expected to begin in 2022. And the resulting data will support the efforts of decision makers in better addressing climate adaptation needs in the Canadian Columbia Basin. The data will be shared through the Columbia Basin Water Hub database, which officially launched in March of this year. So this brings us to the topic of monitoring and reporting. As I mentioned, the 2017 conference hosted by Living Lakes concluded that the Columbia Basin required both a coordinated monitoring network and a central database to share water data. The Source Water Protection Toolkit also discusses monitoring and reporting as a single tool. And this highlights the essential relationship between collecting data and sharing it with others. People and organizations who are collecting water data are usually doing so because they want their data to contribute to better stewardship of these valuable resources. If the data and information are not being shared outside of the monitoring organization, the impact of the data will be limited. Making your data available to others allows it to potentially become part of the larger data set being used by environmental professionals, researchers, and government agencies for purposes such as assessing the impacts of climate change, preparing for extreme events like flooding or drought, or planning stewardship and conservation projects. Additionally, sharing your data can make others aware of what and where you are monitoring, allowing for better coordination and the use of time and resources across sectors. So water monitoring needs to go beyond just collecting the data to sharing the information and ensuring that it can be used by those who need it. The Columbia Basin Water Hub was developed to serve as a tool to support the sharing of data and provide a central place for the data to be accessed. The Water Hub officially launched in March of this year and now hosts over 175 data sets from 35 different contributors. And these numbers continue to grow as we connect and collaborate with new contributors. It is a place where decision makers, researchers, students, professionals, and the public can access a wide variety of data and information about water in the Columbia Basin. The database can host or provide links to water data of any kind, including numerical data, maps, reports, and images. These may be contributed by First Nations, community groups, industry, local and regional governments. It serves as a long-term archive of the decades of monitoring that has been conducted across the Columbia Basin. The Water Hub is also the host of data collected by a number of Living Lakes programs, including the Groundwater Program mentioned previously, the Kootenai Watershed Science Program, which monitors surface water in small and high elevation watersheds, and FIMP, the Federal Lake Survey Methodology that Living Lakes recently revised and is applying to a number of lakes in the Columbia Basin region. So you're welcome to explore the Water Hub at cbwaterhub.ca.
I will now discuss some of the technical details and infrastructure that power the water hub. So we use the CCAN system, which is the Comprehensive Knowledge Archive Network, an open source database management software that is used by many other databases, including the Skeena Salmon Data Center, as well as the provincial and federal open government databases, among others. So CCAN is installed in a server where the data is housed and is made up of a PostgreSQL database, plugins that are written in Python, a web server called Apache, and most importantly, using Git for version control and development. The front end or public facing side of CCAN combines all of these components into a web portal that provides data to the user in an easy to use interface. So looking at the structure of the site itself, each file that is uploaded to the water hub is called a resource and the resources pertain to resources that pertain to a specific water body monitoring site or initiative can be grouped into data sets. Each contributor to the water hub has the opportunity to create an organization profile page which holds all of their data sets and provides information about the organization. These organization profile pages allow our contributors to be recognized for their efforts and allow contributors to remain ownership and control over the data sets that they have shared. You can access the organization profiles of our contributors by clicking on the organizations tab at the top of the WaterHub homepage. Under the data sets tab, data sets can be filtered by contributor, file type, keyword, or hydrologic region on the left-hand side of the page. Data sets are also displayed spatially on our map search page. So in terms of where the data comes from, the process of sharing data with the water hub has several steps. With each new contributing organization, we begin with the co-creation of data management plans and data sharing agreements. These are essential to understanding the current data management practices of the contributor, their priorities and needs, and how the water hub can best support them. Once these documents are completed, we provide upload templates and training in how to use the database to upload data. The Water Hub team carries out a quality assurance and quality control protocol on each file that is uploaded. The data can then be made available to the public. One challenge that we encountered is that there is a considerable range in digital literacy and access to technology across the basin, and many of our contributing organizations are volunteer based or otherwise have limited capacity. So to address these factors, our team has taken a customized approach to the data sharing process for each contributor, providing varying levels of guidance and technical support as needed. In some cases, users upload their own data independently, but for other contributors, our team has helped them to format and upload each file. So one of the biggest questions that we had when developing the database was how we would integrate data from many different sources into a single platform, as there are so many different methods used to collect data as well as differing perspectives and ways of knowing. And we want to provide a platform for all people who are concerned about their watersheds to have their voices heard. So we developed several tools to facilitate the inclusion of resources from many different sources. Firstly, we created the Water Hub data grading system to make users aware of the different types of information, varying levels of data quality and different standards that resources in the Water Hub may adhere to, while taking into account that our users may also wish to contribute non-numerical data, such as reports or traditional knowledge, which cannot be assessed using quantitative criteria. Next, we request that all files are accompanied by thorough metadata to describe the data. This may include site location, methods, instruments used, any data processing that has already occurred, standards adhered to, or disclaimers. So users can assess this information to determine whether a resource meets their needs. Next, our team conducts a quality assurance and quality control protocol on each file, as I mentioned, to review the data, assign a water hub data grade, confirm that all relevant metadata has been included and that files are formatted properly. Our standards and recommendations for data sharing and formatting are guided by the FAIR data principles, which were designed to support the reuse of data by ensuring that the data and supporting metadata are shared in a manner that makes them findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So through all of these features, the Water Hub is able to host many different types of data and information, which can have a wide range of applications. Since the official launch in March, the Water Hub project has led to a variety of positive outcomes for water stewardship in the region. Users can now access data that has been collected by over 35 contributors from a single repository, and much of the data that has been shared was not previously available online. Prior to the development of the Water Hub, much of this data was held on private computers or even on paper and at risk of being lost due to changes in programming and technology or as people retired. 
This data is now archived through the Water Hub and will be particularly useful to identify long-term trends and climate change impacts in the Columbia Basin over time. Several contributors have also shared the feedback with us that completing data management plans and engaging in the data sharing process has helped them to identify gaps in their own monitoring or data management practices. We've also provided guidance for several um, organizations starting a water monitoring program in terms of best, manage, best practices for data management. This has contributed to an improved standard of data collection and management in the basin. Finally, the relationships between Living Lakes Canada and our data contributors will allow for further collaboration and increased coordination of monitoring activities across the basin. Identifying where monitoring is currently occurring supports the Columbia Basin Water Monitoring Collaborative's initiative to prioritize water monitoring needs, allowing for economies of scale by nesting existing programs into a comprehensive basin-wide priority monitoring matrix. So throughout this process, we've learned a lot from our contributors, users, and those who were involved in database development. And I can share with you a few of our key learnings about monitoring and reporting now. Firstly, developing a data management plan, which identifies how you will collect, analyze, store, and share your data can be a very useful tool when planning your program, as well as to communicate these procedures to your monitoring team and ensure that the standards are being adhered to. Within your data management plan, ensure that you consider details such as filing structures and file naming to avoid confusion or the creation of conflicting copies. And also consider how your data will be backed up or preserved over time to prevent the files from being lost. As I mentioned earlier, the availability of metadata is critical for others to be able to reuse your data for decision-making or research. For some of our contributors, trying to gather these details many years after the monitoring has taken place has been very challenging and in some cases not possible, which creates limitations on how the data could be used moving forward. If you are collecting data with the intention of sharing it through an existing database or portal, connecting with that database at the start of your monitoring program or field season to get an idea of any requirements that they may have for formatting or metadata can reduce the effort required to share your data later on. And then as Heather mentioned, spreadsheets and statistics can be very valuable to other professionals and data analysts, but they are not always the most effective way to communicate information to decision makers or to the public. So including resources which provide context for your data, such as charts, posters, and photos makes the data more engaging for users, allowing more people to benefit from your work. One of the key takeaways from the development of the Columbia Basin Water Hub has been that the sharing of data can be more complex than one might initially think and it can be very beneficial to consider the reporting stage of your project throughout the planning and data collection processes. So in terms of next steps for us, we hope that other basins and stewardship organizations can benefit from the efforts and lessons learned from the Columbia Basin Water Hub. The Water Hub was designed to be used as a template that could be implemented in other watersheds through the use of open source software and code sharing. Over the last year, we've also spent a lot of time engaging with our users and getting feedback on the existing Water Hub database, identifying additional needs and features that users would like to see. And we are currently working with an environmental software developer and user interface designer to identify opportunities to improve and expand upon the Water Hub's capabilities. We've had considerable interest and engagement with this project from within the Columbia Basin and beyond, making it clear to us that the Water Hub model is a necessary and valuable tool. We want to ensure that this resource is available in the long term and can continue to serve our community by identifying sustainable sources of funding for this project. Two page summaries of both the Water Hub and Monitoring Collaborative programs are currently available and a full length case study of the development and operation of the Water Hub will be available in January on both the Living Lakes website and the Water Hub itself. If you'd like to receive updates about the progress of the Water Hub and the Columbia Basin Monitoring Collaborative, you can sign up for the Living Lakes newsletter and I will post links to all of these resources in the chat. So thank you for providing us with the opportunity to share our work with you today. If you have any questions or if you're interested in contributing to the Water Hub, you're welcome to contact our team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paige. What a great initiative. I'm really looking forward to poking around that website. If uh, the speakers could now turn on their cameras, and we're going to move into the Q&A part of this. So I don't have any questions posted yet. So I encourage the audience to go ahead and ask your questions if you have any or comments. And if anybody, 
Yeah, I was just going to say, if any panelists want to add anything as well, go ahead. <laughs> I was just actually going to ask Paige if I can. Um, mm -hmm. Would you be able to help your group be able to help other regions develop some similar hub for their watershed region based on your experience? Right, that's definitely one of our goals. We're just still sort of working on what the what the framework for that will look like and how we could roll it out in collaboration with other organizations that are working on similar initiatives. So definitely stay tuned. And you mentioned that in 2022, you'd be reporting out as kind of like a case study, like what's that going to look like? Is it going to be a report that we could take a read of with lessons learned and that sort of thing or? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So it's going to be a full length case study looking at all of the background information, the development process, operation, um, how things are working currently, and then lessons learned and recommendations moving forward. Great. Looking forward to reading that. We do have one question. It's uh, could you expand a bit more on the, the challenges of creating the water hub? Some of the challenges faced? Definitely. So so there were sort of the technical aspects of trying to figure out which system to use and what would work for everyone and which features we needed. And then additionally, there's sort of the community engagement side of things, which has been another challenge, just trying to get people involved and um, yeah, trying to connect with everyone. And like we said, making it accessible to everyone with that range of digital literacy and technology access and just capacity has been one of the biggest challenges. So definitely providing that personalized support for everyone has been a big way to overcome that obstacle. Just as a follow up question for me on that, what kind of people do you have on your team developing this? Like you've got some technical people, did you hire a consultant? Like how did you, who made up your team putting together this hub? Right, so from the start, it was very collaborative with people from the community being involved, all levels of government, First Nations being involved with steering committees, which guided the direction that this was going to take and what was needed. And then on the Living Lakes team, we have our Applied Innovation and Technology Manager, Santiago. So he looks after a lot of these technical side of things with the code and the, the database itself. And then myself doing the database and community engagement. So connecting with our contributors and supporting them in using the database themselves. And then we did also have a software developer who sort of deployed the CCAN system for us and helps us out ongoing with these updates. And then we're also working with Foundry Spatial, the environmental software developer, and they're helping us with these um, sort of user experience upgrades as well. So very collaborative effort. And what approximately was your budget? <laughs> or is your, is your budget? We would have to get back to you on that with no the, problem. the numbers. <laughs> But it's been it's been about three or four years in the making now, so mm -hmm. an ongoing project for sure. Any other questions from the audience? Go ahead and type them in. I should have had some prepared before the webinar. I apologize. Heather, anything else to to add before we wrap up? Then I th I thought your presentation was really interesting. It's something I've never seen you present on, and I really appreciated the thought you put into it. And the, it, I found like a lot of really good takeaways from your presentation. Can you it, just tell me how, what your process was for putting it together? Like, did you just pull that from your brain or were you looking at resources? <laughs> I feel like we need to put a lot of that into the toolkit <laughs> if it's not there already. <laughs> yeah, um, I, no, I didn't just pull it off from my brain. <laughs> Basically, I, I feel like I had to stray out of water science where I'm really comfortable and into more socio sociology or something mm -hmm. like that where I'm really not comfortable <laughs> and recognize that if I can't if I can't communicate what I'm studying to the people that need to make decisions in a way that suits them, not me, it does nothing and goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. And like we were chatting earlier before the seminar began today, um, you know, there's always the debate of this is a great toolkit, but we don't have jurisdiction in our upper watersheds. True. And, you know, it goes to what Paige said as well. You know, we've got to have the data. But I would just offer a caution that one of our earlier speakers in this series offered, and that is if we wait till we have perfect data, we will wait until the windows have closed for taking efficient action. So I would say that, you know, get get going and keep letting the data tune 
what you're doing as you as you move across. And as much as the province will be involved in this, I honestly believe that a lot of this is being done grassroots from the bottom, moving upward, and that we need to sort of probably be working from both ends at the same time to, to get source water protection to happen. But I really feel like 2021 was a perfect demonstration of the risks that are out there and the kind of watershed resilience we're going to need to meet that and especially critical areas of a watershed that require extra protection. Um, mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to bring people forward on that journey with us. That's how political will evolves. And so it, it, I was confronted by doing this presentation with the, uh, the necessity of being a good communicator if you want any of this to go beyond your own brain. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's really important. And maybe for a lot of people, it's all very intuitive, but it was interesting. I don't for me think to, so. <laughs> okay. Read a whole lot of papers mm -hmm. and find the commonalities between those papers on how to be a science communicator. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there's actually a degree available from some universities, mm -hmm. science communication, period, full stop. Interesting. Like, wow. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. It's timely because I've been doing a lot of presentations for boards and councils up and down the valley on the toolkit itself. And I've really struggled with what to include in those presentations. And usually at the end, I'm kind of greeted with, that's a great project, highly collaborative, nice job, but we don't have jurisdiction in the watershed. So, you know, how are we actually going to improve source water protection? And I've been giving the answer kind of like what you just said, you know, we, we have to work together. You know, we can't wait for the province to be able to to do it for us either it, there's just no time for that and so anyways and just emphasizing that the toolkit is just a small step in the in the right direction but the work is just beginning and we all need to continue to work together agreed so. and i also would like for everybody to fully recognize that the watershed goes all the way like for here in the okanagan to the lake shore right through the municipal areas municipal mm -hmm. is a, a a major player in watershed mm -hmm. and watershed change. So um, we do have some jurisdiction and I'd love for us to have more, but uh, like as one of the speakers suggested that was talking about legal tools, it's possible that some municipalities are not utilizing all of the jurisdiction they actually have mm -hmm. already in their um, toolkit. So, you know, it's really important, I believe, to do these, these seminars and bring uh, minds together and, and share. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you never know where a great idea will come from. Mm -hmm. And I really think that, we're, that this whole process of, of trying to maintain this communication is so important. And I, you know, being a scientist, I love data. So mm -hmm. I love the, the, the project that Paige and her team have been on, you know, mm -hmm. like it's just on, I, and the point I thought you made was well made Paige, you know, if we don't get this into a common repository, then as people age out and it was on paper, that data is gone. That experience is gone. It needs to be stored somewhere, especially now, mm -hmm. especially now. Definitely. We're, we're already having those challenges trying to track these people down who have sort of moved on to other, other programs yes. or moved out of the area and things like that so yeah the timing is critical so Paige while you're unmuted mm -hmm. there is a, a second question about the hub and it's mm -hmm. what what are you thinking about the Columbia Basin thinking about for long-term sustainable funding to maintain this hub do you have a sustainable funding model right so we've, we're looking at a number of options um, right now Living Lakes is part of the watershed security coalition that is advocating for the BC mm -hmm. watershed security fund so that's definitely something that we're looking at. Um, the province is looking at the water hub and the monitoring collaborative as regional case studies as well. So there's potential for this to be used as a template expanding into other areas. We also wanted to mention that our work received funding from the Healthy Watersheds Initiative in BC, which helped to support the water hub development over the last year, as well as the Canada's digital super cluster um, for the collaborative freshwater data commons project. So all mm -hmm. kinds of things going on. Great. And while we're on the topic of funders, I forgot to mention earlier on my thank you slide that 
And just a, a big, big thank you to the funders for this source water protection toolkit project and these webinars. So we had Ministry of Municipal Affairs, Interior Health, City of West Kelowna, City of Kelowna, OBWB, and then most recently the Healthy Watersheds Initiative, the same group that Paige is talking about. And the watershed, the Healthy Watersheds Initiative has been just instrumental in funding, I think about 60 projects throughout this year. And it's a provincial uh, COVID-19 economic recovery fund, but it's providing this sort of framework for long-term watershed security funding, which Paige was just talking about. So I think that's everything for today. Um, I forgot to mention earlier as well that I've been talking about a webinar 10, which would be um, purely Indigenous speakers talking about uh, perspectives, silk perspectives on water and projects that are going on in the valley. It won't be ready to um, do in Jan January, January 12th. So I'm not going to lump it in with this series, but stay tuned because we are planning on doing a webinar like that in the new year possibly after March Madness, to be honest, <laughs> because I'm getting the response that, you know, we've got Christmas break coming and then we have to wrap up our uh, field reporting, etc. So um, I'm thinking April. So stay tuned for that. We'll probably just reach out to this group with uh, an invitation to that as well as others. And lastly, I wanted to give a shout out to a few people who have managed to make it to eight out of nine or nine out of nine of the webinars. So great, great job, you guys. There's Allison, Heather, <laughs> Ian, Ivor, James H, John, Ken, Marta, Mike, Nicole, Paris, Patty, Rachel, and Shelly. So that's, that's the core group that have listened to my presentation at the beginning nine times. So they could probably do it for me. And uh, in addition to those folks, there were, you know, 30 or 40 people that made it to five out of the out of the nine webinars. So excellent. I hope you really enjoyed the series. I, I know I've enjoyed it. And again, thank you, Casey, if you could turn on your camera for a minute so I can say a quick thank you to you. And uh, this is Casey who helped me develop the webinar series, did most of the background work, all the background work. So thanks again. And I will say goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Oh, Tangi, sorry, I missed Tangi. She's also been to all of them. <laughs> okay, thanks very much and bye for now. Thank you, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>